The Power of the Blood Covenant, a study into the vast riches of God's love. Before we begin, I want us to pray and ask God's guidance for my lips and also for your hearts, that your ears and your hearts would be able to receive the things that are said and that you would be able to separate the wheat from the chaff and receive the things that you need for this time. Let's approach God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your forgiveness that you show to us, your mercy, your loving kindness, Father. Those things that we cannot believe at oftentimes that you forgive us for, the things that we have done, the maybe the the speed bumps that life has provided to us, Father God, or maybe the things we've imposed upon ourselves through our own poor choices and bad decisions. God, I pray that you would help each and every one of us through this teaching series to allow those things in the past that have been obstacles to us, perhaps those things that those weights that have held on to us and leached on to us, Father God, we want you to help us see those things the way you see them, that we are forgiven by the blood of Christ, that we have received redemption because we've been grafted into that tree of Israel and that Abrahamic covenant, Father, that you provided so long ago. Father, help us to understand this covenant. Help us in our frail minds, Father, to understand the glorious mysteries of your gospel. Help us, Father God. I pray that all of us would put our pride down. We don't come with any sort of arrogance, Father God, or a pharisaical heart or a pharisaical mind, but instead we come to you with that humble attitude, asking, Lord God, show us what it is that you would have us to understand. We come to you with humility, and we ask, Lord God, for our, the eyes of our understanding to be open wide so that we would have a greater and stronger and closer relationship with you, Father, because you are the goal that we pursue. You are the reason that we have breath, and you're the reason, Father God, for our very existence. So help us to center upon you tonight. Help us to center upon your word and to receive the things that need to be heard. And we give you all the praise carefully, sir, because you are so worthy. And it's in your precious dear son's name, Jesus Christ, that we offer this prayer. Amen. Okay, let's get started. Why study covenant? Why study covenant? Covenant can sound like a boring word. I'll admit it. It sounds like a boring word, covenant. Well, it's not a topic that is taught too often. It's not something that you see a whole lot of books on. There are some good, some good books on the topic. But really, when you take a look at the bookstore and you look around for uh, teachings on this topic, you'll find that they're somewhat obscure. And part of it has to do with the fact that in the West, where we are today, here right here in America, or I know many of you are in other countries, but the majority of you listening tonight are in America. And we in the West, we don't tend to think in terms of covenant. We tend to think in terms of contract. I want to compare and contrast those here in just a minute. But let me ask you the question, why should we study covenant? There's several reasons, and I want to give you just a few. Number one, to gain a more intimate understanding of God and his word. Nothing will help you dig deeper into the word of God than understanding the very fact that the Bible is nothing but a string of covenants woven together. Understanding the fact that the crimson thread that is woven all throughout the fabric of God's Word, from Genesis to Revelation, is something known as covenant. In particular, something known as blood covenant. And we're going to be delving into that particular type of covenant in this teaching series. Now, number two, because God deals with man based upon covenant. Everything that God does in his interaction with man is based upon covenant you will come to understand that all of God's interactions with man are based upon covenant, not upon anything else. God views his relationship with us 
through the lens of covenant. So when we begin to understand the concept of covenant, we begin to understand the way God views our relationship. And until we understand covenant, it makes it very difficult to understand the type of relationship that God has desires to have with his children. So understanding covenant becomes all the more important as we study God's word. Also to number three, to understand our identity in Christ. Our identity is found in the covenant that Christ and God have shared together called the new covenant. It is a covenant whereby God and Christ together have formed a covenant that we have the benefit of being grafted into. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that amazing? God and Christ together, working together through the shed blood of Christ upon the cross, it was a divine strategy from the very foundation of the world that Christ would lay down his life. He would shed his blood for mankind. And because that satisfied and satiated God, we received our justification. Our justification was allowed. We could be declared righteous. We were allowed to be sanctified, set apart, made separate. We were able to now, at some point, be glorified in the future. And all of this, if you're not a Jew, if you are not uh, of the nation of Israel and of Abrahamic lineage, then that's why the Bible tells us in Romans 9, 10, and 11, how dare we attempt to boast against the branches that we have been grafted into. Thank goodness that we who were without covenant and we who were alienated as Gentiles away from the Jewish covenants, thank goodness that we've been grafted in. How dare we boast against the Jews and boast against Israel and boast against the olive tree itself because God has grafted us in and he has made us the recipients of the covenant of Abraham and the new covenant, which is far superior to the old covenant that was established with Moses at Sinai. So we will come to understand our identity in Christ through the study of covenant. We will have freedom. We will have power. We will have assurance. We will have an understanding of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude, if we could say it that way. We would also understand that we have some accountability. We have some responsibility according to this, this new covenant. And so by understanding covenant, we'll, the puzzle pieces will come together. We'll understand what's God's role and what's our role. And you will never be the same again, once you fully allow the idea and the concept of covenant to fully transform your mind, the meaning of it will impact your spiritual life. It will help you persevere. It will help you to understand the Bible better because it is what the Bible is all about. But as I mentioned to you previously, Covenant is a foreign concept today. It's not something that we tend to think about. It's not something that we even use in our typical vernacular. In fact, the concept of covenant has largely been replaced today with the idea of something called contract. We're familiar with legal contracts. But here's the problem. Contracts are based and rooted in mistrust. They're based and rooted in suspicion. The parties do not trust each other when they sign a contract. They set limits upon their own responsibility. The covenant, instead, though, is an agreement made in trust. It is one established between two or more parties, but typically two parties, who love each other. And they, do, they don't put limits upon their own responsibilities. And we're going to get into, in our next session, next week's session, exactly what that covenant actually looks like. Today we're going to talk about the fact that the Bible is full of covenants. We're going to talk about each one of them very briefly. We're going to talk about how God views covenants with man. But covenant is rooted in mutual trust. I want you to know that Jesus did not sit down with an ink pen and a piece of paper and write an agreement and a contract with his disciples of the Passover. Instead, he raised 
the cup, and he said, this is the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant. He did not make a simple contract with his folks. He made a covenant with his people. And that is something very foreign to us, friends, because we, again, think in terms of legal contracts. But God doesn't. I'll give you a great example, the cultural misunderstandings of covenants. Native Americans who uh, understood the idea of covenant. In fact, if you study just ancient civilizations, you'll discover that covenant is very widely understood. It's only in our more advanced legal understanding, I guess is the best way to put it, that we have come to embrace the idea of contract with so much commerce and the steady stream of commerce now. A handshake just doesn't quite do it. We need legal, we need legal help and we need lawyers and we need contracts. But the Indians understood covenant. The Native Americans understood covenant. And they made uh, treaties with the great white man, you know, the white man, when he would come in and they would uh, attempt to establish a covenant with him. The problem was, of course, after they established these covenants and they would smoke the peace pipe, the sacred peace pipe, and that, that indicated to the Indian that there was a, a, uh, an establishment of a covenant, which meant that they would be protected one from the other, mutual trust. Well, the settlers, the colonists, didn't view the covenant as a covenant. They viewed it as a contract. And so at the very first uh, chance that they could get, they would often violate the covenant. And this was an abhorrent thought to the Indians because they didn't understand the breaking of a treaty. When you broke a treaty, it was you might as well just be dead because that's exactly what you would receive. So we certainly have examples of cultural misunderstandings of covenants in our modern day. But the concept of blood covenant has ancient origins. It was found in nearly ancient every ancient society. And what it meant in times past, it means today. There is a wonderful book by Andrew Murray called The Two Covenants. I highly recommend that you check out this book. Uh, I believe you can find it for free on the web, and in fact, we will probably put a link to it on our website where you can download it. But here's a little quote uh, from his book, Andrew Murray's book. He spoke some very strong things to the 1800s, uh, the Christians living in the 1800s during his lifetime. He says in his book, Blessed is the man who truly knows God as his covenant God, who knows what the covenant promises him what unwavering confidence of expectation it secures, that all its covenant's terms will be fulfilled to him, what a claim and hold it gives him on the covenant-keeping God himself. Friends, we have a covenant-keeping God. To many a man who has never thought much of the covenant, which probably includes many of us, a true and living faith in it would mean the transformation of his whole life. Friends, that's what we can receive from an understanding of the covenant. If you need your spiritual life to be freshened up, if you need, if, if, you're, if your spiritual life is becoming stale, let me tell you, you don't just need the next best-selling book that's put out at the Christian bookstore. You need to dig down into the idea of covenant. You need to understand what God has done in your identity in that new covenant and what God's responsibilities to you are, and what his promises to you are. Those are amazing concepts to understand. Andrew Murray goes on. He says, the full knowledge of what God wants to do for him, that is, we could even say to you, the assurance that it will be done by an almighty power. Almighty God is the one who backs up his own covenants. The being drawn to God himself in personal surrender and dependence and waiting to have it done. All of this would make the covenant the very gate of heaven. May the Holy Spirit give us some vision of its glory. And that is my prayer tonight over this whole entire series, that the Holy Spirit would come to each one of us and it would help us to receive a vision of the glory of the covenant that is everlasting, that was made possible 
by the shed blood of Christ upon the cross when he shed his blood for you and me. All predetermined, all established from the very foundation of the world. How powerful is the covenant? It tells us in Psalms 25, 14 that the secret of the Lord, that's a cool phrase, the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he, God, will make them know his covenant. That tells you that understanding and knowing the covenant has something to do with fearing God, and it is a secret of the Lord. Understanding the covenant is a deep, deep thing. It's not too difficult, but it does require us to dig into his word. There is no private interpretation. There are no there are no secret uh, interpretations that we can find. Instead, everything is available to those who will put on a mining hat and pick up their axe and go down into the mines of God's Word. You will find gems and glorious uh, gemstones and diamonds. All kinds of beautiful jewels await you as you go down into the, and mine God's Word for wonderful, precious stones. They exist in his word. And I would urge you to make that something that you want to do. Make that something that if you don't already have a desire for that, that you would begin to ask God to put that desire into you. I will admit to you that I have not always liked to dive into the Bible. The Bible sometimes can be a very scary book. It can be a very tough book. It Sometimes, friends, Dare I say it, it can even seem boring at times. I know, I know many of you are listening to me saying, well, I've never felt that way. Well, you're more spiritual than me, I guess. But the truth of the matter is, is that all of us know that the Bible is not, it doesn't seem as relevant to us as the best-selling book that's out at the Christian bookstore. We like people to explain things to us, and that's okay. Commentaries are good. Listening to your pastor at church, that's good. Helping, you know, listening to exposition and listening to commentaries, those are all good things. But I'll tell you that the power for living comes from eating the bread of God's Word. Jesus says that man cannot live on bread alone, but upon every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And that Word of God is what gives us strength. It's what gives us strength. Now, Augustine of Hippo, St. Augustine, famously said this, the New Testament is the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Perhaps you've heard that phrase or seen that phrase before, and that right there, friends, gives us an idea of what, the New Testament and the Old Testament are all about. The Old Testament, that word testament, I'm going to show you in just a minute, literally means covenant. So we could, it would be accurate to say Old Testament is Old Covenant, and New Testament is New Covenant. Testament equals covenant. So the concept here is that the New Testament is a story of the New Covenant, while the Old Testament is a story of the Old Covenant. That's really all the two are. In the Hebrew, the word is berith. It means to cut a covenant or to bind. The idea or the concept of binding something, almost as if we are bringing two things together and tying them together. That's the idea of a covenant to cut a covenant. It also means to uh, cut something or put an incision into something to the point of drawing blood. It is the idea of cutting something. So this word here indicates a cutting of covenant or also binding, which in reality are two uh, similar things meaning one thing, that is to bring two things together. Now, in the Greek, 
the word appears as a diatheke. And this word uh, implies will or testament, last will and testament, uh, kind of an idea of, uh, of uh, you know, this, this idea of will, testament. But at the same time, it's the same word that's used in the Septuagint, which is the Hebrew writing of the New Testament. And then also it appears in the New Testament every time the word covenant is used, Diatheke is the word that's placed there. So these are the two phrases that are used in the Bible when it comes to covenant. But when we read the word covenant, or when we read the word testament, we should automatically think the word covenant, because the two are virtually the same thing. Now the Bible is a book of covenants. That's really all it is. There's covenants between man and man. There are covenants between a leader and his people. There are covenants between nations. And then there are covenants between man and God. For the rest of this teaching series, I want to just briefly highlight, or for the rest of the, tonight's uh, session, I want to highlight the teach or the uh, covenants between God and man. I want to focus on these. And before we go too far, I want to explain that there are two types. There are conditional covenants, and there are unconditional covenants. Conditional coven covenants referring to an agreement that is binding on both parties for its fulfillment. That is, there are conditions placed upon the covenant. Obviously, if either party fails to meet their responsibilities, the covenant is broken, and neither party then has to fulfill the expectations of the covenant. But an unconditional covenant is an agreement between two parties where only one of the two parties has to do something. Nothing is required of the other party. And that's what an unconditional covenant is. Now, God makes both of these types of covenants with his people in the Word of God. Let's take a look at some of these. The very first one is the Edenic covenant. This shows up in Genesis chapter 1 and also in Genesis chapter 2. In the Edenic covenant, God promises Adam life and blessing, but is it conditional? or unconditional? Does anybody want to guess? Is the Edenic covenant conditional or unconditional? Jerry Roger and Sam Rune both say conditional. It is conditional. It's conditional. God promises Adam life and blessing, but that promise is conditional upon Adam's obedience to God's command to, to do what? Not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God provides everything that's necessary for uh, human life in the garden. But again, he says, do not eat from the fruit of the tree. Uh, we could go into this much more in depth, but for the sake of time, we're just going to briefly touch on these. These are not the blood covenants that we are focusing on. We're in particular going to be focusing upon the New Covenant uh, for the rest of this teaching series, but I want to just briefly introduce you to each of these covenants, and we'll take a look and see if they are conditional or unconditional. The next one is the Edemic Covenant, found in Genesis chapter 3. Here we have the story of Adam and Eve after they sin, and then God pronounces judgment upon them. Is this a conditional or an unconditional covenant? Any guesses at all? The Edemic Covenant. Well, it is an unconditional covenant. Unconditional covenant. There is no appeal. There is no human responsibility involved. It's simply due to mankind's sin. Adam and Eve eat of the fruit of the tree. As a result of Adam's sin, the curses are pronounced 
There will be enmity between Satan and Eve and her descendants, painful childbirth for, for women. There will be marital strife between the man and the woman. The soil will be cursed, and Adam will earn his, bless, or earn his living from the sweat of his brow. Introduction of thorns and thistles. Survival will be a struggle. Death is now a certainty, and death will be the inescapable fate of every single living thing on the planet. There is no compromise. There is no changing God's mind here. This is the result of Adam and Eve's decision. And they brought and introduced sin into all the entire world. And as they leave the Garden of Eden, we see this picture in the, in the Scripture that God makes tunics of skin from animals and provides it to them. And as we talked about in one of our previous teaching series on the book of Genesis, this implies that there was, here we see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Here they have the skins of animals, implying that God did in some form or fashion sacrifice an animal. There was blood shed. The idea or the point to Adam and Eve being sin demands blood. The wages of sin is death, and the only way for remission of sins is by the blood of a shed life. And so we see the animal skins upon Adam and Eve. We don't know what transpired. We don't know what God had to say. But we do know that they had received skins of an animal. Why? Well, because I believe that God did demonstrate to them the importance of sacrifice and the need for sacrifice. And so as they left the Garden of Eden and the cherubim and the flaming sword were there to keep them out, we see Adam and Eve clothed in the bloody skins of an animal that had to pay the price of death for their sin. And it was a picture of what was coming in the future. We see in the Bible that the Bible tells us that blood is sacred. God views blood as a very sacred, very, very sacred life force. In fact, the Bible tells us in Leviticus chapter 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I, God, have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. We see also in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. The idea here being, in other uh, translations, say the word forgiveness. There is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. The only way for our sins to be covered in the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant, was the shedding of blood of bulls and goats and of animals but they could only atone for sins that is they could only cover the sins but when Christ comes he is able to eradicate the sins through his blood they're not just covered they are wiped away they are tossed into the sea of forgetfulness now when we move to Cain and Abel we see that it says in Genesis chapter 4, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. You see, Cain is taking stuff out of the ground, the same thing that he is made of, the same thing that his body is composed of, the soil, the dirt. He is bringing that or something that is of himself. He's bringing the very best of himself. Sounds like a Pharisee, doesn't it? He's bringing the very best of his self to the Lord as an offering. And then it says, And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Now, you know, I have to admit, I used to have a little sympathy for Cain because I said there's really nowhere in the Scripture that tells us that we were supposed to offer up a lamb, offer up a, an animal. We don't really see that in the Scripture. There really is no law. But until I read Hebrews 11, verse 4, where the Bible tells us right here that it was by faith Abel, 
brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. Friends, do you see that word? It says, by faith, by faith. Now, how does faith come? How did faith come into Abel? The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The only way that Abel could have displayed faith in his sacrifice would have been to have heard the Word of God. You cannot display faith without a Word of God. You cannot display faith without hearing the Word of God. The Bible tells us in it in and of itself, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Abel knew that he was supposed to sacrifice something to God and that blood had to be shed. His daddy told him, his mama told him, somebody told him, and he knew. And Cain knew also, and that's why he did not receive the blessing of the Lord for his offering. The covenants of the Bible, let's continue. The Noahic covenant, the uh, idea here in Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 18, it's a conditional or an unconditional covenant. Well, let's talk about what it is first. In essence, it lays down the, the idea of capital punishment. Here we are right after the flood. It lays down the idea that man can now eat animals. It lays down the idea that human government will now be required to stem the spread of sin. And of course, human government was never the des design, it was never the intention, but it's something that had to arise to prevent sin from spreading even quicker. Therefore, human government comes into play after the flood, but it certainly was not something that was designed from the very beginning. The Nehoah Covenant was an unconditional covenant. We move on to the Abrahamic Covenant found in Genesis 12, 13, 15, 17. So much about the Abrahamic Covenant. It was reconfirmed uh, through Isaac in Genesis 26. It's reconfirmed through Jacob, also known as Israel, in Genesis chapter 28. And there are three main features to the Abrahamic Covenant. The promise of land... God's going to give Abraham land. He's going to promise him descendants, and he's going to promise him blessing and redemption to his family and actually to the, all the families of the earth through Abraham. Was this a conditional or an unconditional covenant for those of you listening? Very good. Very good. Unconditional. It was an unconditional covenant. An unconditional covenant. Now, as we look at the, uh, at the Abrahamic covenant, we could go very, very deeply here because there is a lot to read, there is a lot to see. Um, but we're going to have to continue on. But I do want you to understand the Abrahamic covenant certainly had a lot of components to it that we're going to have to dig into later, but not in this series. Jennifer, did you have anything to add at all before I keep going? Uh, no, Jerry. I uh, we have you know some people weighing in on whether they think the covenants are conditional or unconditional, and it looks like for the most part everyone has gotten these correct. Um, no, I thought it was a great point about Cain and Abel. And the fact that you you do almost feel sorry for Cain because you you wonder did he really understand did he know that God wanted the the blood sacrifice of an animal, but um, I I thought it was a great point and something I hadn't really thought about is is that uh, he he would have known because the Lord showed Adam and Adam taught his children. And Abel, Abel did that by faith, and that comes from hearing. So I just want to reiterate that and realize that's such a great insight from that uh, those scriptures. So thank you for that. Well, praise God. 
All right, so there's Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. Let's go ahead and move on real quickly to the Mosaic covenant. We find that in Genesis chapter 19 through 31. This, of course, becomes known as the Old Covenant. It's the covenant that is initiated at Sinai. It is the one that the Jews of today look back and believe to be the ultimate covenant. It contains 613 specific commands. 365 of them were prohibitions, often joked by the Jews, one prohibition for every single day. And then there were 248 demands in there concerning everything, political life, marriage, hygiene, diet, uh, sex, finance, welfare, uh, political alliances. I mean, everything is covered in the Mosaic Covenant for daily living. It's also known as the Sinai Covenant in some circles, but in essence, the Mosaic Covenant was made with Moses as the mediator between God and the nation of Israel. And the Mosaic Covenant is the most remarkable legal code ever devised by any ancient people. When you compare it to the Hammurabi Code or some of the other, uh, other legal codes that were back in those times, you see the pristine nature of the legal code of the Mosaic Law, and you discover that it is very well crafted and that it is highly advanced in the way that it approaches the law. Here's the problem with the Mosaic Covenant. It didn't really take away any sins. It simply foreshadowed the bearing of sin by Christ, who would be the perfect high priest and the perfect sacrifice, as we would learn later in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, an amazing chapter that, that shows how Christ fulfilled the Mosaic Covenant in all of its details as he came down and was our high priest and now is the mediator between God and men. But the law had no power to give people new life. It had no power to save. It had no power to forgive. It had no power to redeem. It only had the power to atone. By the shedding of a bull's blood or a goat's blood, that it was possible to cover your sins. But that had to be done each and every single year. Every year the high priest had to go in on that special day into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle that blood upon the mercy seat. And he had to, to go through that process every single time. And then there, of course, was the scapegoat. And you can read all about that in the Old Testament. But the idea here, the Day of Atonement, it's simply a covering. It's not the real thing. It's not what Christ provides through his shed blood as he comes down to earth as fully God and fully man and lays down his life for our sins, sheds his blood as the perfect lamb of God and fulfills the old covenant at every point, never sinning, never falling, never deviating from God's law, never deviating from God's wisdom, never deviating and falling into sin, but instead perfectly fulfilling every single thing. And when Christ lays his life down, he shows up in the most holy of holies, not those made with hands, with humans, but that made by God himself in the heavenlies. Christ goes to the holy of holies in the heavens and brings his blood to, to God Almighty, and the Father God says, yes, I am satisfied with this. And now we have an advocate with the Father through Christ Jesus. We no longer have a high priest on earth that cannot feel each and every one of our infirmities. Christ has felt every single one of our infirmities. He has felt every single one of our passions. He has felt every single one of the things that, that, that bring us uh, sin. Yet he did not sin. And he is able to sympathize with us. He is able to understand us. And the Bible says that he is not sitting up in heaven now playing a harp, but that he is making intercession for us each and every day. His job was not just to come to the earth and walk around for 33 years and do a few miracles and lay down his life and then go back to glory. His goal, his mission, was to continue on his work whenever he arrived back in heaven. He now exists to make intercession for us. You have an attorney in heaven. You have an advocate in heaven who is constantly watching over you, 
who is constantly interceding for you and who is waiting to hear from you. And when God looks down upon you, and if you have the blood of Christ on you because of your belief and faith, the same way that Abel placed his faith in God, if you place your faith in God by the blood of Christ, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you listen to that Word of God and if you believe that Word of God and it gets into your soul and you actually have a change of heart, the Bible says that you have an advocate, you have an attorney. Christ stands before Almighty God and says, He is forgiven because of my blood. And God absolutely 100% agrees. It's an amazing, unbelievable mystery that God would even devise this. But he did. And the Mosaic Covenant, known as the Old Covenant, was replaced by the New Covenant in Christ. Our precious, dear Jewish brothers and sisters who brought forth all of the prophets, who brought forth uh, Moses, who brought forth uh, David and all the way through history, who brought forth the Bible. They are now living uh, somewhat peaceably in their land, and they are completely blinded to the fact that the Mosaic Covenant is an old covenant. They have been blinded. I have told people before that reaching the Jewish people is a very difficult process because the Bible says that they have literally been blinded. They're very difficult to reach. But we continue to pray for the peace of Israel. And we are so thankful that their fall meant our glory. And the Bible tells us if their fall meant our glory, then what does their glory mean for us? Friends, can you even imagine what that means? The Jews fell. They were blinded. In the Bible, in Romans, Paul says that meant good things for us. And then he goes on and says, but if their fall meant good things for us, then how much more good things will it mean when God finally opens their eyes? And that day is coming, friends. That day is not too far away that God is going to open up the eyes of the Jewish people, and they are finally going to understand what has happened to them. They're going to understand how they have been blinded, and they are going to turn in mass to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, their Messiah. The one in, Je in Jeremiah 31, 31, where it says, I will make a new covenant with my people. That new covenant was not made for us, friends. It was made for the Jews. Jesus Christ wept as he looked over the city, and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not let me. And he desires to see his people, those he shed his blood for, us too, thank goodness, we've been grafted in. And he shed his blood for the whole world. But he came specifically to the Jewish people. He has an enduring, eternal covenant with them. And it has not changed. He has a, they're a very special people to him. And the day is coming when they are going to turn in mass to their wonderful Savior. And we need to continue to pray for that. And that's not going to mean negative things for us, friends. It's going to be even better. It's going to be even better. But we thank God that he has grafted us in to that wonderful covenant. Then we have the Palestinian covenant. Real briefly, Deuteronomy chapter 30, you can read all about it. It's basically an amplification of the Abrahamic covenant with a specific emphasis upon the land blessing. Here, um, the uh, it's made between God and Israel right before Moses dies and Israel enters into the promised land. Um, 
and it it basically specifies exactly what part of the uh, Middle East belongs to Israel. And we see all that there. You can go and read that. It is an unconditional and eternal covenant. When all of the political leaders over there are messing with the borders of Israel and talking about how they're going to give this to so-and-so and they want to give this piece of land to so-and-so, they're all messing with something very, very, very over their heads. They have no clue, apparently, that God has an eternal, unconditional, unconditional covenant with the nation of Israel and the people of Israel. And because they have sinned and because they have not recognized their Messiah is not enough for God to turn his back on them. The Bible tells us that in Romans. It's not enough. He still is going to honor his covenant with those Jewish people. He has made a covenant with them. That land is theirs. It's theirs. It doesn't matter what political people say. It doesn't matter what they come up with. It doesn't matter what they what they concoct. It doesn't matter what kind of treaty, treaty they have. And if they try to divide the, the uh, city of Jerusalem and give part of it to a people it doesn't belong to, they're going to bring wrath upon themselves because this is an eternal, unconditional covenant that God has made. And you don't mess with God's covenants. You just don't do it. And the Palestinian covenant is an unconditional covenant. We also have the Davidic covenant, another amplification of, uh, of the uh, Abrahamic covenant. It really gets into the, the, uh, the fact that uh, David is going to continue down that line. Of course, the Messiah comes through the line of David. Oh, it's a wonderful covenant. We won't get into it now, but 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 1 Chronicles chapter 17, which pretty much mirror each other, uh, talk about this Davidic covenant that you can read about, and that one also is an unconditional covenant. Oh, I wish we could dive into all these, but we're focusing upon the one single covenant that is directed right towards you. You see all these other ones? They were foreshadowings to what we now have as the new covenant. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 31, that the day will come, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, not an old covenant, not a Mosaic covenant, not an Abrahamic covenant, not a Nohoa covenant. I'm going to make a new covenant. With who? With the people of Israel and Judah. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write on them on their hearts, I will be their God, and they will be my people. They will be my people. That's what God wants out of the deal, friends. God wants a people. He wants a people. He desires you. It's the mystery of all the ages that a God, an eternal God, an all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent God would desire me? You, made of dust, he desires a people. And he is, the Bible tells us that his eyes go to and fro across the earth, looking for those who fear him, looking for those who will follow him, looking for those who will give in to him and to his leadership and to his kingship because he is king and we are his subjects. It's a monarchy, and he wants his people. He desires and longs for his people. And the new covenant, when Christ comes down, as I told you, when he was sitting in that upper room, he didn't need to explain to his disciples what was happening. When they saw the bread and they saw the wine, and whenever he lifted that cup and he said, this is my blood, this is the blood of the new covenant, when he said that, there is not an explanation because in those times the Jews knew exactly what he meant. They knew exactly what a covenant was. They knew exactly what he was doing. We don't because we live in a time of contract, but they lived in a time of covenant. And I'm going to show you the difference between the two in next week's teaching. We're going to really dive deep down into what the difference between 
the contract and the covenant are. And we're going to talk about how the ancients viewed covenant. And when you understand how the ancients viewed covenant, and you understand how the Hebrews viewed covenant, the Bible all of a sudden takes on a different dimension. When Jesus Christ came and he offered up the bread and offered up the wine, he was establishing a new covenant between God and people and his people. The old covenant was written in stone, but the new covenant was going to be written on the hearts of the people. And it's made possible only by the faith in Christ, whose own blood was shed for the sins of the world. Luke 22.20, I've quoted this scripture tonight. Luke 22.20 says, After supper, Jesus took another cup of wine and said, This wine is the token of God's new covenant to save you, an agreement sealed with the blood I will pour out for you. And this is an unconditional covenant. This is an unconditional covenant, meaning that God has bound himself to keep it. He will keep it. Let your faith be strengthened tonight that no matter what you see in the news, no matter what you see around you, no matter how bad you think things are, no matter how bad you think things are going to get, God has made a covenant with his people. And if you put your faith, hope, and trust into the resurrected Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, then that covenant is with you. And God is not a man that he should lie. He is not capable of breaking a covenant. He is not a covenant breaker. He is a covenant-keeping God who you can trust with your very life. He is worth laying your very life down for. For the Christian, Christ is the theme of both covenants. As we look back upon the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Edemic covenant, the Edenic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, we see Christ. Christ is woven from the very beginning. In fact, in the very first scripture of the Bible, in the beginning, uh, God said, uh, in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was uh, was in darkness, and, uh, and, uh, and there, it, there was a void. And the Bible then says, God said, let there be light. And what we see in the very first three verses are God, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and God speaking his word saying, let there be light. Christ is the light. The Holy Spirit hovered over the waters, and God is the one who did it. The Trinity shows up in the very first three verses. Christ is in the very first few sentences of the book of Genesis, and he continues all the way throughout the Bible. He is the theme. He is the theme. Christ is the theme. In the Old Testament, Christ is in pictures, but in the New Testament, he is in person. In the Old Testament, Christ is in ritual, but in the New Testament, Christ is in full color reality. In the Old Testament, Christ is prophesied, but in the New Testament, Christ is real, and he's present with his people. In the Old Testament, Christ is implicitly revealed, but in the New Testament, Christ is is explicitly revealed. The New Testament is really the New Covenant. And the New Covenant, at its very core, is wrapped up in one phrase. The New Covenant, at its very core, is wrapped up in one phrase. And that phrase is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When Christ made the new covenant, it was a binding agreement. And now, he is in you, and you heard the Bible say, you are in him. He is in you, and you are in him. This is the concept of covenant. It's not a contract. 
This thing cannot be ripped up. It cannot be filed away and forgotten. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. And that is the mystery of the covenant. And that covenant is what we're going to focus on next week. We're going to talk about the ancient practice of covenant, which is very interesting, how it's been practiced all over the world. And there's a wonderful book about it called The Blood Covenant by a gentleman by the name of Henry Clay Trumbull. Uh, if you have a chance to look him up, I think you can find his book for free. It's written back in 19 or 1890-something. He uh, wrote a scholarly book on the blood covenant and the, the sources of, of it through ancient times. Very fascinating. We're going to talk a little bit about that, and we're also going to explain, if you've never read Richard Booker's book called The um, Miracle of the Scarlet Thread, I believe is what it's called. I don't have it in front of me right this second. But, uh, oh, it's, an, it's a beautiful, wonderful book. If you haven't read it, we're going to describe the nine steps of the Hebrew covenant ritual that he explains in his book. Oh, it's so wonderful. And we're going to understand what it is, to, what it means to be in covenant with someone. And when we understand that the other side of this covenant relationship is God himself, when we fully understand that we have entered into an eternal blood covenant, everlasting blood covenant with God himself, we realize that the benefits, oh, the benefits of that are unbelievable. And woe to us if we forget them or if we fail to take advantage of them. Because if you are in Christ, he is in you, and you have many benefits as a covenant partner with Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about next week.